Good afternoon, distinguished delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I call to order the seventh meeting of the 57th session of the Commission for Social Development. I invite the Commission to resume its consideration of agenda item three, sub item A, entitled uh, on the priority theme, addressing inequalities and challenges to social inclusion through fiscal wage and social protection policies. And sub item B, entitled review of relevant United Nations plans and programs of action pertaining to the situation of social groups to hold the interactive dialogue with senior officials of the United Nations system. Distinguished delegates, I welcome you all at this interactive dialogue with senior officials of the UN system on the priority theme. This is the first time such a dialogue is held at the Commission for Social Development in accordance with ECOSOC Resolution 2018-3 on the methods of work of the Commission. After the high-level panel discussion on the priority theme that we had on Monday, 11th of February, Today, senior representatives of the UN system will engage in an interactive dialogue to keep us abreast of major or recent activities supported by the UN system in addressing inequalities and challenges to social inclusion through fiscal, wage, and social protection policies. The main objectives of today's dialogue is to ensure policy coherence at the global, regional, and national levels in addressing inequalities and promoting social inclusion. Through dialogue, we will also enhance coordination and support to member states in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I am pleased to welcome the distinguished panelists today. Uh, we have Ms. Alicia Barcena, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, who is joining us via video link. Uh, Mr. Munir Tabe, Acting Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Africa. Welcome. Mr. Kave Zaidi, Deputy Executive Secretary for Sustainable Development of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Welcome. And Mr. Abdullaye Mardiye, Assistant Administrator and Director uh, of the Bureau for Policy and Program Support of the United Nations Development Program. Welcome, sir. I'm also pleased to welcome back the moderator, Mr. Elliot Harris, uh, United Nations Chief Economist and Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development at the Department of Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations. I'm delighted to welcome the lead discussants in the room for this panel, Mr. Vincius Carvalho Pinero, Special Representative of the International Labor Organization to the United Nations and Director of the ILO Office in New York. Mr. Paul Ladd, uh, Director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. And Ms. Ursula Vinoven, and, and please apologize if I mispronounced your names. Uh, representatives, uh, representative of the International Tele Telecommunication Union to the United Nations in New York. Um, at this moment, I turn the meeting over to the moderator, uh, Mr. Harris, who will conduct the interactive dialogue with senior UN officials on the priority theme, and I look forward to a productive and interesting exchange of views. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be able to moderate uh, this discussion this afternoon with our senior colleagues from the regional economic commissions and from the UNDP. Over the past two and a half days, we've uh, had the opportunity to learn from experts, from high government officials, from academicians, and from representatives of civil society and of UN agencies, funds, and programs of the types of fiscal, wage, and social protection policies and measures that have had some measure of success in addressing the problems of inequality and the challenges to social inclusion. Uh, we've dealt with those on more or less global terms, but of course, while inequality itself is a truly global challenge affecting every country, there are specificities in the ways in which the inequalities manifest themselves and in how the countries have addressed the inequalities. And we're fortunate indeed to have these representatives of our regional economic commissions here who can share their insights and experiences in how the countries in their, uh, in their regions have dealt with some of these challenges, uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked, allowing us to compare and contrast the experiences and the policies and measures put in place, and giving us the opportunity to draw lessons from experiences in one area that might be applicable elsewhere. But of course, 
The issue of inequality in broad terms is a major constraint to development overall, and, and we will look to uh, our good friend Abdullahi Mar DA to have a sense of how uh, the UN Development Programme is taking this into account in the work that it does and what some of these challenges might be for the development trajectories of, of the member states. Before we get into the actual presentations from the panel discussions, allow me to give you an overview of how we intend to proceed this afternoon. We'll give to each panelist between seven and ten minutes to make a presentation, and um, after their interventions, I'll open the floor for any specific questions that are directly linked to the presentations the panelists will have made. We'll then turn to the um, lead discussants, who will then uh, give us their views on what they've heard or other aspects that might be particularly relevant to today's proceedings. And then I will open the floor for questions, answers, comments from the, uh, from the floor, from the uh, um, representatives who are present, I'm asking only that you uh, try to limit your interventions to about three minutes, if possible, so that we have the time to have an active, uh, interactive exchange and to uh, feel the comments and suggestions from everyone present. So with that, without further ado, let me turn to um, my friend Ms. Alicia Barsine, the Executive Secretary of ECLAC, the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Alicia, yeah. you have the floor. Sure. Come on, yeah. Over to you, Alicia. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Elliot. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I am very grateful also to Mrs. Carolina Popovici, who is uh, chairing the meeting today. Um, I want to very quickly introduce the, the issue related to Latin America and the Caribbean when we talk about equality and inclusion, what is going on. In, uh, we, we would like to give a little bit of overview of where the region is standing. And of course, we have a first problem, which is the global disruptions and the, and the urgency to implement Agenda 20, uh, 2030, of course. And first of all, because the economic cycle is changing. That is, we have slower growth, high interest rates, and financial uncertainty. We have fiscal consolidation, tax evasion in illicit funds, which is a major characterization of what's happening in our region, trade tensions and the weakening of multilateralism, disruptive impacts of the digital technological revolution, of course climate change, and of course the growing inequality which has eroded the social contract and the citizens' trust. So this is happening in our region as well. How do we see equality in ECLAC? We see equality as the, uh, in the, at, at the center of development, of the whole agenda. We understand that Agenda 2030 has SDG 10, but we, we believe that equality is at the center of the whole agenda. And we have identified equality not, not only as a foundational value of development and non-negotiable ethical principle, because we believe that equality is a right, and it's a right-based approach, the one we are applying, but also we have evidence. We just produced a document that is called Inefficiency of Inequality, in which we are showing that inequality is inefficient for the economic uh, development. And we are going to uh, explain in a minute. And thirdly, that equality is a prerequisite for achieving economic and social progress. That is, if we want really to close the structural gaps and to achieve convergence between productivity, investment, and decent jobs, we definitely need equality at the center. And we show in this study how inequality is a requirement because there is an inverse correlation between productivity and inequality. You can see that the red uh, dots at the left side of the graph show the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean who have very high inequality and very low productivity. On the other end, we have countries from the Nordic countries, for example, which have great, great equality and very high productivity. We have graphs that show this at the same time uh, in, in investment. Now, despite the progress, I have to say that after 2002 in the region, there was a, a very important crossing point. That is, the trend was the growing of inequality up to 2002. After 2002, the, the trend of inequality started to diminish in a very important way. That is, inequality went down between 2002 and 2014 
in, in, in various points, if we consider the Gini coefficient between 0 0.5 and, 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 and it came down to 0 0.4 almost. And it slowed down a little bit between 2015 and 2016, but still we went up. Despite all these efforts, unfortunately, the, uh, the, uh, the, the region still is the most unequal region of the world. That is, if you see the graph at the, at the, at the right-hand side, you will see that Latin America is still placed on the most unequal bar uh, if we compare it with other subregions of the world. Now, we just finished a study that we call the social panorama. We were invited to present some of the studies. So we have two that we can uh, present to the social commission. One is inefficiency of inequality, and this one, which is a social panorama, which was presented only la a, a few weeks ago. And we show very clearly how poverty has gone down from, uh, in the 12 years, from 44% to 27.8% up to 2014, and extreme poverty from 11.2% 11%, to 7.8%. However, as of 2015, the situation started to deteriorate again, and we are now in levels of 30.2% in, in poverty, 189 million people, and 10.2% uh, in terms of extreme poverty, 62 uh, million people. So we still have a long way to go in terms of poverty and inequality. When we talk about leaving no one behind, the other thing we present in this study in numbers is that we disaggregated the problems of equality and poverty in the different population groups. That is between rural and urban. And you can see that poverty is 20 points higher in rural areas than in urban areas. And also that the poverty rate among children and adolescents are up to the year of 14 years old is 19 percentage points higher than those aged between 35 and 44. That is, poverty has a face of a child. The children are the ones more affected with poverty in our region. And the poverty rate is 23 percentage points higher among indigenous peoples. That is, we have made a very clear disaggregation among the population groups that is presented in this report that is available to everyone. Now, one of the greatest problems in Latin America and the Caribbean is the labor market. Uh, labor and, and wages represent a very important uh, uh, aspect to combat poverty and inequality. But the labor market in Latin America and the Caribbean has high levels of informality. You can see here that 32.7% of the workers are unskilled, self-employed workers, which we are using as a proxy for uh, informal because informality is not that well studied in many parts of the world and in the region much less. So which accounts for that more than 64% of the workers in the first quintile, that is in the, in the most poor part of the, of, the, of, the, of the segment of population, 63.9, are people that are not let's say, participating at all in the, uh, in the contributory systems. And we have there 48% uh, in total, in, in, in average, 48% that uh, are affiliated or contribute to pension system. This means that 52% of the people, more than half of the population of Latin America and the Caribbean, are not contributing to the pension systems and this is a problem that is uh, accumulating in the future. Then we also go to the young people, the youth. What's happening to youth? And here we, what we show in this graph very, very specifically is the percentage of young women and men between the ages of 15 to 29 years old that do not study or do not have a paid work. It doesn't mean that they don't work. Women, for example, 31%, 31.2% of women are not studying or in a paid work. That means that these women, many of them, young women, 15 to 29 years old, are working but are non-paid, that is non-remunerated for the work they do. They are mostly in the care uh, systems of their own families without receiving any paid. 
So, and, and men are 11.5% of men are neither working or studying. So here we are reflecting a very huge problem, particularly for the young people that are not finding the jobs, particularly women. We, we are proposing a very concrete, let's say, uh, formula to solve or at least to start solving the problems of inequality and poverty. And we call that the double inclusion. That is how to improve both the social inclusion, but also the labor inclusion. Because if you see this graph, you will find that 44.5% of the population of Latin America and the Caribbean are both excluded. They have a dual inclusion, a double exclusion. That is, they are neither a labor included or socially included. That means that they don't have the household income sufficient to, uh, over the line of poverty. That's what we call the labor exclusion, when the household as a whole doesn't have the income sufficient or above the line of poverty. And uh, social exclusion means that they don't have access to electricity, to housing, and of course, that some of the members of the household do not go to school, even if they are in the age of going to school. So here we are reflecting that 45.5% of the population in Latin America and the Caribbean have double exclusion. And of these, let's say the worst are the ones in the rural areas. 69.8% of rural households have double exclusion. When we go to double inclusion, that means that this is a, a very important prospect. That is, at least one or two members or, or members of the household should have either a pension or an income over the line of poverty and, of course, access to the minimum uh, social services. In some countries, this is considered the multidimensional poverty measure. We are dividing this because it belongs to different uh, policies. Let me come quickly to policies and, 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 and in closing. First of all, the fiscal policies. What are the two, the two elements that really contribute to reduce poverty and inequality are twofold. One is strongest gains in income, labor income, and we have the countries that have reduced poverty, very, very high reductions on poverty like Chile, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Paraguay, Colombia. These countries have done it through uh, mainly gains in the labor income. That is, let me, let me just say that 72% of the income of a household comes from labor, from wages. So this is, so, that, this is why it's so important. On the other hand, we also have strongest gains in pensions and transfers. That is, countries like Uruguay, Panama, Costa Rica, Argentina, Peru, and we have all the lot, all the countries of the region are presented in this report. But these are the ones in which cash transfers or, or pensions have played a most important role in reducing poverty. When we go to fiscal policy, we measure very concretely and country by country how much is the central government spending on social issues. And we find that in Latin America, this rose, it was higher between 2011 and 2016. Today, 11.2% of GDP is devoted to social expenditure. However, if we compare this with OECD, OECD devotes 30%, almost three times more than what Latin America and the Caribbean countries devote to social expenditure. And social expenditure is crucial because it helps on two fronts. First of all, on cash transfers, we have measured again country by country how much the cash transfer can be a gateway into social protection for the poorest and the most vulnerable. And we have find, we find that the, the investment on CCTs represent only 0.33% of the regional GDP. That's not a lot of money, but this is a money that is really very well spent by the poor households. Unfortunately, as of 2012, this, uh, 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 let's say, uh, these uh, cash transfers have been diminishing since 2014 onwards. So we believe very much that cash transfers should be kept very highly in the social expenditures. On another social expenditure that we believe is extremely important is on labor market policies. That is, 
They are about, we study in detail six countries of Latin America that devote 0.45% of their GDP to labor policies. What do we mean by labor policies? Training, capacity building, incentives for uh, companies to, to create employment. We refer to the protection of unemployment. And, and look at the comparison between Latin America and OECD countries. OECD countries devote 1.31% of their GDP to labor policies, and particularly to the protection of unemployment. When a, a worker uh, has to leave its job, they are really protected, and this uh, permits the, uh, the, the provision of capabilities. And finally, the, I think the greatest challenge in Latin America is we have less and less fiscal space. And this fiscal space, the, because everybody's in the fiscal consolidation, because growth is not enough, then one of the things we are suggesting to member states is to go and, and go to combating tax evasion and illicit flows. Tax evasion in Latin America and Caribbean goes up to $340 billion a year, 6.7 of GDP. When we are talking about labor policies or cash transfer policies, we don't even get to 1% of GDP, which is where we have to be investment, investing. So we need to use these tax evasion and illicit flows, we, which come up to $92 billion. This is money that the countries will need to appropriate for the good cause of social uh, inclusion. So we believe that equality through double inclusion is a way to go. It has to be guided by the principle of universalism, welfare state, and sensitive, of course, to difference, equality of rights, leave no one behind, universal policies of health, education, and social protection. And of course, equality helps to increase productivity and economic growth. But we believe that the two social policies, inclusion, uh, social inclusion and labor inclusion, are necessary together to make sure that we are able to move towards decent jobs, social services, and quality basic infrastructure. So we believe that there is a possibility to prepare ourselves also for new scenarios on the, on the world of the future of work and the uncertainties of technology. So we have to strengthen the care and the social systems uh, altogether. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Elliot. And I uh, turn back to you. Thank you for everybody to your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Alicia. A most comprehensive presentation. And from that, I take um, two particular points I'd like to um, underscore once again, is that underneath the headline figures, there are very disparate developments. And uh, as you, you, you drew the distinction between the rates of poverty and the rates of, of exclusion in the urban areas and in the rural areas, and that distinction sometimes gets hidden by the overall figures. And secondly, um, you pointed out that it's not enough to look at just one approach, but one has to combine simultaneous policies in different areas, different types of policies, to effectively address the, the issue of inequality in all of its aspects. Uh, thank you very much for that. Let me turn now to Mr. Munir Tabe, who's the Acting Executive Secretary of the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. Munir, over to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Moderator, Excellencies, uh, dear delegates, dear colleagues on the podium. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you the perspective of social development from the uh, member states of the Arab region. I wonder if the presentation is up on the uh, screen. Thank you. Um, like all regions, inequalities in, in the Arab region is um, cross-cutting from most uh, sectors, health, education, social protection, employment, but particularly in our region, it is compounded by years of conflict that is, uh, has had the negative effect of rolling back much of the progress that had actually taken place in the MDG era to even before the MDG process. So significant um, challenges in the region that are common to other regions, but also compounded by conflict. Uh, four basic groups that are facing high levels of inequality and exclusion in the region, of course, youth, like most region, an emerging uh, group that is older persons in our region, persons with disability, and unfortunately, a fairly large number of displaced persons. 
Let me start with the context of the population. Population in the Arab region with the highest growth rate in the world has more than tripled in the past half century, going from 130 million in 1970 to about 400 million last year or the year before, and expected to reach more than 600 million in 2050. Very a serious challenge for provision of social services if this population is not uh, put to great productivity and use in terms of the economic growth and e economic productivity. Particularly interesting in this population growth is that the youth constitute about 60% of the total population. About seven, this is a, under 30. 71 million between the ages of 15 and 24 are in 2015. This number is estimated to reach 92 million in 2030. Particularly problematic with this group is that on average, 30% of them are unemployed. For women, the situation is much more difficult, 47%. In the rural areas, much higher. And of course, it goes to uh, say that in, in conflict zones, the unemployment rate is alarmingly high and compounds the challenge even more uh, difficultly. As I said, an emerging uh, group in terms of stress on social provision of social services and fiscal uh, challenges are the older persons. Estimated to reach about 100 million uh, by 2050, which therefore require immediate policies as of now. Uh, older women would constitute more than half, more than 50% of this group. 70% of the workforce currently is not covered in under any form of pension coverage or old age coverage, which therefore makes the uh, challenge of social protection outside the public service is quite complicated. It goes without saying, of course, that for the older generation, uh, geriatric health uh, need for the longer term is going to rise exponentially, and as such reforms are needed now in the area of social protection for the elderly to be able to cater to this group as they become a part of the social group that requires assistance and support from the state. An additional group are the disabled. There's about 11 million uh, disabled persons. This number we expect it to be much higher once the figures uh, are counted on all the disabled uh, persons in conflict countries have been counted, have been taken into account. And of course, this presents even an added strain on the fiscal resources. Um, for instance, 22.8 of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Jordan have been found to have some form of disability or another. This is a good segue into the last group that I will talk about that um, are a challenge in terms of social protection and social development, are the refugees and the IDPs. They currently count about 29 million that are forcibly displaced, about 15 million internally displaced people, and about 14 million refugees. Of these 14 million are refugees in, uh, are nine million that are refugees in other Arab countries. With a situation of already strained fiscal uh, context, you can imagine what additional nine million refugees to countries of the neighborhood, particularly of uh, Syria, uh, represent in terms of a challenge. Just to give you an illustration, at least for two countries that are neighboring to Syria. Currently, 20% of the population of Lebanon, that's 20%, are Syrian refugees. Therefore, the strain on provision of uh, social services, health, schooling, social protection, is enormous strain on the current system in, in the country. You have double shift schools, you have clinics that are operating, also double shifts to at least cater as much as possible to the refugees. 7.1% of the population of Jordan is also refugees. Of course, we all um, understand this is a temporary situation and there's already a 
a, a movement of return some of the refugees to their countries of origin. This cannot be said, obviously, to refugees from Palestine who have, um, uh, who have a, a particularly difficult situation in terms of return to their uh, countries of origin and will continue to be hosted by countries in the, in the region. Let me talk a little bit about sol solutions and progress in terms of addressing these challenges. Um, quite a few countries are beginning to reform their social protection systems. The idea is to improve delivery mechanisms via unified registries, improving targeting to the most needy, particularly in rural areas and for marginalized groups. The hope is that this would op optimize impact. And in fact, when we do the analysis, we see that uh, such a targeting would help in the implementation of at least eight of the sustainable development goals and 16 of these targets, including those related to poverty, education, decent work, sustainable cities, and peace and justice. Uh, particularly interesting in the region is the idea of uh, autonomy, <laughs> the inequality of autonomy. Um, the 2018 analysis confirmed what is uh, well known, that inequality of income and opportunity are significantly linked to inequality of autonomy. This autonomy gap in the region has implications for policies, whether on gender, on social and religious tolerance, and preference for social justice and civic action. Let me turn to the issue of youth. Uh, this is a good example of uh, uh, cooperation between the three commissions, the, uh, the Africa Commission, Western Asia Commission, and the Asia Pacific Commission have worked together to uh, put in place a set of tools that help young people get engaged in public policy making. In the Arab region, we've tested this in Jordan, in Kuwait, and in Tunisia, and hope to be able to expand this to other countries, particularly countries that will be emerging from conflict and that start thinking about sustainable development planning processes. Um, this is in addition to an initiative uh, uh, led by ESQUA in Jordan that has fostered more integrated, sustainable, and inclusive policies, particularly on population and development with a focus on youth unemployment. Uh, this is in support of the principle that properly addressed uh, young people can be a boon to economic growth and stability and poorly addressed can become part of the instability and crisis and therefore they require very special and immediate attention. Uh, the group that is aging uh, needs sufficient attention and immediate attention so that they age with dignity uh, and they require um, not only support from the state, but also if properly addressed, they could become part of the solution in terms of contributing to supporting families, communities, and of course the countries. As I said, uh, quite a few of them are without uh, social protection, without old age protection, and therefore it is vital to ensure that they, they are included in policies both on the current level and the future generations. Um, this leads us, of course, to rethinking policy, fiscal policies. It is uh, in order to address these challenges, whether it's with youth, the disabled, the refugees, or the uh, gender women that we haven't even mentioned here, we clearly are looking at medium to long-term fiscal policies to guide and sustain adequate and appropriate social expenditures with a clear aim of um, accelerating the progress on the SDGs while maintaining the difficult task of maintaining a balanced and sustainable set of fiscal policies. Uh, let me conclude by saying uh, we, in, in promoting this idea of, uh, of fiscal uh, rethinking, we are promoting, we're testing right now a social expenditure monitor, at least in three countries, that is going to look at how uh, fiscal allocations is being made by each of, for each of these uh, challenges, and the idea is to have, in the end, a pool of data and tools to help inform policy analysis and reform, improve social protection, reduce poverty and inequality, enhance human capital, and promote gender inequality. Let me conclude with the following slide that in our area, conflict is development in reverse. It's forced migration, health and social burdens, family fragmentation, infrastructure destruction, 
and we certainly are looking forward to a period when we are able to engage countries that are currently in conflict to start talking about longer term social development that is sustainable, social economic development, and clearly, of course, environmental that is sustainable in the long term. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Munir. It was very interesting indeed that you highlighted the situation of the two large population groups on either ex extreme of the age spectrum, the youth on the one hand and their unemployment, mm. and on the other hand, the older persons, the aging population that is not adequately projected by by social um, instruments. It is um, also, I think, a little bit sobering to see the, the impact that conflict has had on the ability of the region to take care of its people and to preserve the gains um, that have been made in the, in the Millennium Development Goals. And, and I think that's a very sobering lesson for all of us to take from, from the region, see what can be done there. Let me turn now to Kaveh Zahedi, who is the Deputy Executive Secretary for Sustainable Development at ESCAP, uh, Kave, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Elliot. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Madam Chair, first, uh, uh, a thank you to, to you and through you to the organizers for giving us this opportunity, uh, a first time for us to, to, to present within the agenda of, of the Commission. And, uh, and we look forward to sharing with you some of the key regional trends related to inequality and social protection in Asia and the Pacific. I think, like the others, at the outset, it's, it's important for me to recognize that the Asia-Pacific region has witnessed extraordinary progress over the past few decades. In less than 30 years, between 1990 and 2013, over a billion people were moved out of poverty, led, of course, by progress in China and in India. More recently, we've seen that economic growth in our region has stayed fairly robust in the face of global economic turmoil. Our region's employment to population ratio remains higher than in any other region of the world at around 60%, and more people than ever have access to basic services in Asia Pacific, services like water and sanitation, services such as education and healthcare. That, of course, is the story of success. But at the same time, what we are seeing in our region, like many of the other regions, is inequality. Inequality in all its forms persists and is, in fact, on the rise. This, coupled with the fact that over a billion people still live on less than $3.20 a day, and some 400 million still live in extreme poverty on less than $1.90 a day. Very large numbers, obviously, uh, still poor and the, 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 the inequality on the rise. Now, in terms of inequality of, of income or inequality of wealth, what we're seeing in Asia Pacific is that the average Gini coefficient has increased, including in some of our region's most populous countries. So they are moving, in a way, in the wrong direction when it comes to income inequality. Uh, at the same time, the region is now home to the largest number of billionaires, possibly something to celebrate, but it also illustrates the massive gap between the haves and the have-nots, the billionaires and those who uh, don't have enough to, to sustain themselves. But the story of inequality doesn't stop with income. It doesn't stop with, with wealth. What we are seeing is also an increase in inequality of opportunities, inequality in terms of access to basic services. Millions of people in Asia Pacific still do not have access to a number of basic services, like sanitation, like clean fuels for cooking and heating in their homes. And, and, and what we've done in, in our analysis as we've looked at these different dimensions of inequality is we've quantified inequality and access to these opportunities through what we call a dissimilarity index. Now, the countries with the highest overall levels of inequality of opportunity are found in South Asia and in Southeast Asia. Inequality is most pronounced in terms of access to clean fuels, in terms of access to education, particularly higher education, in terms of decent work as measured by full-time employment. 
Inequality in decent work is, is particularly alarming, uh, we, we would think, with nearly one in two workers, or some 930 million people, in vulnerable employment. So employed, yes, but in vulnerable employment. And this is the second largest share in the world after sub-Saharan Africa. So while the region's employment to population rate is the highest in the world, the majority lack social protection and therefore cannot afford to not work or even to fall sick. Now, as a response to this, the countries in, in our region, our member states, the ESCAP member states, have been urgently looking for ways to deal with the increasing inequality, the increasing vulnerability that impacts large parts of the population. Our work at ESCAP has shown that investing in social protection is probably the key as it brings benefits right across the SDG spectrum. It helps to tackle poverty, SDG 1. It helps to reduce inequalities. It helps to build resilience against shocks and crises. Social protection, moreover, drives economic growth by building a stronger, healthier, and of course, more productive workforce. Every dollar that's invested in social protection multiplies by over two times when the cash enters the communities. So in a way, the message from the work that we have undertaken that investment in social protection is not a cost. It is an investment that brings returns across the SDGs. So given that, how much is our region spending on social protection? Well, there again, the picture is quite clear. The average global spending level on social protection as share of GDP is over 11%. Among Asia-Pacific developing countries, the average is 3.7%, so a third of the global average. Now, this underinvestment, as you could call it, is one reason why 60% of the region's population has no protection. No protection if they turn sick, no protection if they develop a disability, no protection if they become unemployed, pregnant, or even old. That means that only 21 out of 49 countries provide social protection for children and families. Only one out of five unemployed receive unemployment benefits. Less than four out of 10 people have access to affordable health care. And just over half of all the older persons receive an old age pension. And that really highlights the vulnerability that we see across our region. In the latest report that we have uh, uh, published, the social outlook for Asia and the Pacific, which you can find at the back if you're interested, and out of which many of these figures in my presentation are drawn, we estimate that if spending on social protection would reach the global average, so if we pushed it up from the 3.7 to just over 11% of GDP by 2030, the impact on poverty would be striking. At least 233 million people would be lifted out of moderate poverty during that time. And moreover, extreme poverty could be fully eliminated in several countries by 2030 with that level of spending on social protection. Countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, and the Philippines. And because of this, and because of really, I guess, the awareness, not only of the inequality and the vulnerability, but that the solutions lie at hand, the investments that bring multiple benefits, ESCAP member states, supported by us in the Secretariat, have taken really a three-pronged approach to addressing the shortfall in social protection and charting a course for greater collective ambition on social protection in Asia Pacific. First of all, on the intergovernmental side, in our recent Committee on Social Development, member states requested us to develop a modality for strengthening regional cooperation on social protection, a sort of a, a collective effort to raise the bar when it comes to social protection. And this followed multiple discussions to resolutions of the Commission highlighting social protection policies and programs and the need to reduce all forms of inequality. In fact, Inequality was the topic of the last commission session, the very uh, highest, uh, I guess, the body of, of ESCAP. And, and, and when we looked at inequality and when the countries discussed inequality, they looked not only at the inequality of wealth and income, 
the inequality in terms of access to, to services, the inequality of opportunity, but also the inequality of what we called impact. Inequality in terms of the impact, especially of em environmental phenomenon, including climate change, the impact of disasters in a very disaster-prone region. They also, we also looked and they also discussed inequality in the context of technology, a widening gap, uh, an increasing digital divide with the, those who do and don't have access to very basic uh, internet, 3G, 4G going on, through which they can access education, health, e-government, etc. So the panorama of inequality that, that our countries discuss is a broad one. All of this is, is, is based, in a way, on the research and analysis that, that, that we produce to support member states in their efforts to address inequality and increase the investment in people. The social outlook for Asia and the Pacific, uh, as I mentioned, estimated the extent to which countries would reduce poverty by 2030 if they would steadily increase public spending on social protection, on healthcare, on education to match the global averages. The other research I mentioned on inequality in Asia and the Pacific was really the first to review the multiple dimensions of inequality within our region and propose some ways of confronting that. So with the intergovernmental and, and, and the knowledge based on those, ESCAP has also developed multiple tools to support policymakers build more inclusive social protection systems at the national level, in a way to take the ambitions they've expressed at the global and the regional level and translate them into action at the national level. This includes our social protection toolbox, which, for example, has over 100 good practices on social protection that can be easily and readily adopted across our countries, as well as a self-assessment tool on level of social protection coverage. And the most exciting part in terms of our support to countries uh, in, 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 in the social protection field is, is the, a new web application, the social protection impact and financing tool that we're launching that will enable users to estimate the potential impact of various social protection policy options on poverty, on inequality, by specifying the parameters related to, 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 to the eligibility, eligibility levels of, of coverage and transfer. In a way, a tool that helps countries uh, uh, measure and, and understand the multiple benefits that their investment in social protection can bring. So, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator, I, I hope that my brief presentation has provided a useful uh, overview of some of these key regional trends related to inequality, related to social protection, the themes of this commission, and some of the actions that are underway uh, in ESCAP member states and the Secretariat to, to, to support social development, protection and progress, in the region. Uh, again, we very much appreciate the space that you have opened up in this commission for us. And as I mentioned, please, uh, if you would like further information, we have some of these reports in the back that capture the analysis that we have undertaken for the benefit of our member states. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kavi. That was a very comprehensive presentation. And in particular, I'd like to uh, r r draw attention to the fact that you've, you've highlighted not just the inequality of income and wealth, which is what we tend to think about when we talk about inequality, but the access to opportunity that suffers when inequality is, is present, as well as the, the question of the services that are not being equally provided to all of the citizens, whether that is a result of the income inequality or the result of perhaps the shortcomings in revenue generation among the member states, that is a question that I think deserves uh, considerable analysis. So, um, let me turn now to Abdullahi Mardie, who is the Assistant Administrator and Director of the Bureau for Policy and Program Support at UNDP. Abdullahi, I'm sure now it's the larger picture thank uh, you. <laughs> beyond the regions. Uh, thank you. Um, we have heard fascinating presentations from the region, so I just circled around <laughs> those great presentations. But thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator, Madam Chair, Mr. Mo Moderator, dear colleagues. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, yesterday we had a very insightful G77 high-level interactive dialogue on this uh, very central topic. Today's CSD dialogue will certainly provide added perspective to our yesterday discussion. In fact, this year must be called or could be called the inequalities years. In August 2019, 
the G77 in Paris, led by President Macron, will be also tackling these issues. Ourselves in UNDP, we will be devoting our next three human development reports on the question of inequalities. We'll be partnering with uh, Thomas Piketty and the World Inequality Lab, uh, inequality Lab uh, to look, uh, to go deep dive on the issue of inequality. Because let's be frank, uh, we haven't solved yet what this, as I said yesterday, this, the Nelson Mandela called a social evil, which is inequality. And, and we are very sticky in dealing with the issue. So we wanted, as UNDP, drill down further to understand why we're not solving these issues. Uh, without prejudging uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the report that will be coming uh, in the latter part of this year, uh, while I gave yesterday a sneak preview of some findings, uh, we have two major uh, breaks or binding constraint that is making us not deal with this social evil. Uh, you have a cluster of, uh, of problems around the issue of, of asymmetry in global governance, uh, asymmetry in trade policies, asymmetry in uh, global tax policies, uh, global tax governance, or asymmetry in migration policies. But you have a lot of in-country governance gaps uh, in, in, uh, in, in, our, in our own countries. But this is just, a yesterday I gave a teaser, but I would invite you sometime in September when we launch the, um, the, uh, the Global Human Development Report on Inequalities, again, which we are doing with Thomas Piketty. This over-focus on inequalities is not surprising, uh, uh, simply uh, because reducing inequalities is at the heart and at the intersection of all our global ag agendas, be it uh, the Sustainable Development Agenda, be it the Prevention Agenda, being the Sustaining Peace Agenda, and be it also our regional agendas, you have heard from the Rex uh, the centrality of the issue of inequalities uh, in dealing with uh, sustainable development. In fact, listening to the free presentation, you may infer, infer that um, uh, SDG number 10, which is the one that deals with inequality, is the linchpin, the mother of the 17 SDGs. Uh, yet, uh, despite we all agree that this issue is central, uh, we are collectively walking a snail's pace. And yet we do have in our policy arsenals a very powerful tool, a very powerful weapon to deal with inequality. And this is fiscal policy, policy the very topic of our discussion today. We are all well too familiar with what is known as the Nordic welfare model. Uh, while many economies struggle with sizable deficits and high employment, the Nordic countries have, by and large, enjoyed favorable economic growth with, at the same time, social gaps that continue to be very narrow. The Nordic models provide an example of how fiscal policy can more actively be used to achieve not only equity and efficiency. And I hear very often and I read in the literature that the two are, there is a trade-off between the two, equity and efficiency. But this is a case where countries like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Iceland are showing the way that you can do both. So in fact, uh, looking at their model, we can say that target 10.4 of SDG 10 is doable. Uh, it, some countries have proven that it is doable. But for my judgment, for our judgment, this will require three sets of policies. First, expanding the fiscal space, and Alicia talked about it, which is quite narrow in many developing countries. On average, uh, developing countries uh, exhibit a, 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 a ratio of uh, tax to GDP around 13 to 17%. I figure out that in the Nordic countries, uh, that ratio is 45%. So there's a huge gap to, 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 to cover. And uh, the study that we have done on uh, low-income countries show that, uh, to, uh, that leaks would need to uplift by 30% their current uh, fiscal base if they want really to have a dent on inequalities. Uh, UNDP has been actively supporting countries to address that issues. We have a program called 
Tax Inspector Without Borders that we do with OECD, and we have been implementing it in 30 countries. Uh, and we aim to achieve by 2020 uh, uh, 100 countries. Uh, this is a very powerful tool. It shows that, and we have seen it, an investment of $1 improving uh, fiscal capacity of fiscal administrations can yield a $100 on average return in tax collection. This is quite powerful. I always joke that this is the product we could, should be putting in the market uh, because the return is extremely high. So unless we expand the fiscal base of these countries, it will be extremely difficult uh, to use that power called fiscal policy and making, have a dent on inequalities. Second, redistribution policies, and that I think that the Free Regional Commission has dwelled a lot on this issue. Redistribution policies, including, red, 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 I can't say that word, redistribution red, taxes, anti-poverty programs, minimum wages policies are key instruments governments have used to tackle poverty and inequality. And I always cite the uh, outstanding example of Mauritius, who has launched, and we have been supporting Mauritius, World Bank, and UNDP, uh, to have what they call the Marshall Plan, plan in uh, reducing inequality. In a few years, we have seen inequalities go down uh, because they have invested heavily on, 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 on social protection. Again, social protection is not a cost. It's a huge investment. And, uh, and I agree with ESCAP, uh, and they illustrated that in the case of uh, Asia region. However, the degree to which these policies are progressive vastly differ across countries. In general, we have seen a decline in progressivity of taxes, and this is a cause of concern. One example is a sharp decline in corporate income taxes. Attention will need to be placed on how such policy meant to attract more capital is also having adverse implications on inequalities. Many countries are lowering their taxes on with the expectation that private capital will flow in. But if we are not careful, it can adversely affect our social policies. And this is an issue that I think, I mean, I would advise that the G77, when they meet in Biarritz, in, in Biarritz look at it. Third, it is equally important, and here people, when we talk about distribution policy, they look at what we call post-market policies. We have to look at sometimes pre-market policies. I mean by that uh, ensuring that the bro the, uh, we have broader macroeconomic policy that can tackle inequality at its core and prevent the kind of market failures it leads to. For example, countries are more unequal when there is jobless growth, i.e. economic growth which is driven by a few sectors, such as oil or capital intensive sectors. UNDP has been advocating for countries to adopt integrated policies that can enable countries to progress, ensuring no one is left behind, and that we're doing it through our MAPS programs, what we call mainstreaming acceleration and policy support programs to ensure that countries are on the path of achieving the MDGs. This includes creating opportunities for people, especially for women, in lower income thresholds. For example, through promoting labor intensive sectors, developing higher skilled jobs, for example, moving from product, producing textiles and garments to electronics and automobiles, leveraging trade policies that can promote certain categories of employment while also reducing price of consumer goods for low-income households, ensuring equal opportunity to quality education, providing better access to finance and banking for the poor, and access to health care and social services, among others. Let me conclude, Madam Chair, Mr. Moderator, by saying that to achieve this acceleration, in fact, we need acceleration. The 10 goals of SDG 10 give us a framework to act. What it's missing is accelerations. And to need this, I believe, I think that policy debates in countries uh, should be less inequality 
blind uh, by using the 2030 agenda as a guiding framework. Hence, it will be critical that policy dialogues at the country levels, uh, including uh, IMF's Article 4 consultations, and policy discussion, budget discussion at the parliament, not be SDG blind. And this is a message that uh, we in UNDP and other colleagues in the UN system are putting forward when we organize the MAPS missions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much, Abdullahi. It's a very interesting perspective, and uh, it does pose a, a very clear view on some of the challenges that we face in ensuring that countries can mobilize the resources that they need to undertake the kinds of social protection policies that are clearly going to be a part of any effort to tackle and defeat inequality. I turn now to the lead discussants. Uh, we have first to Mr. Vinicius Carvalho Pinheiro, who is the representative of the international, special representative of the International Labour Organization here to UN headquarters and director of the New York office of the ILO. Vinicius, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elliot, and thank you also to the uh, speakers. I think it was a very interesting panel. I just wanted to add a couple of things that are, that are quite important. Today, um, the ILO uh, has launched uh, a major publication it's called the World Economic and Social Outlook, which is basically uh, this year has been dedicated to the SDG 8 review. So basically we're putting the numbers uh, out uh, to, 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 to help in the debate uh, around what, uh, how, how we are in terms of achieving SDG 8 um, uh, as part of the HLPF process. And uh, unfortunately, what the numbers are showing is that we are totally off track. Um, so it's really a yellow light that is blinking uh, right now for us. So we have promised to, to achieve full employment decent work for all by 2030. There's still 170 million people uh, unemployed. And those who have a job, actually, 3.3 million, which is almost 50%, lack decent work. They don't have access to, 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 to basic income income security and basic uh, level of income that could guarantee a decent living. So it's totally uh, an element of, uh, of decent work deficit. We have promised to, 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 to close the gender gap, yeah? and it's not happening. So basically 27% uh, still uh, the, the gender gap between men and women, the equal pay, the equal pay um, gap, uh, and this is not moving. Uh, we had promised to reduce substantially, that was the language that was including the target 8.6, the number of people that are not employment in education training. Between 2005 and 2018, this number moved just two percentage points. Uh, and that means there's still one in five uh, young people that are still, they are, they are not in, in um, education, um, employment education training. So not much uh, improvements there as well. Child labor, that should be a kind of easy call because, you know, we know where they are. We have good numbers. We know the sectors. They are good instruments. There were some improvements between uh, in, over the coming years, but we had promised to, to, to zero it by 2025. And unfortunately, it's not going to happen because there's still 152 million people that are victims of child labor and 40 million people that are still victims of modern slavery. Work accidents, that's also an, an important indicator that is, uh, has been... Um, monitored but as part of the SDG uh, indicators framework is not moving down neither. Actually, it's 2.7 million deaths per year, which is a kind of uh, undeclared uh, epidemic because it's the fifth, let's say, uh, most important de death cause if you look at the WHO numbers. This comes, of course, with lack of social protection. That was uh, uh, something that was ad addressed a lot over this last three days. Stagnant wages and the coupling actually between wages and productivity. Um, so I would say, I mean, this is a moment that we need to stop a little bit and say, so what are we doing? Right? And what could be, could be done for the future uh, in order to achieve at least part of the targets of the promises that were, were made in 2015? And let me say, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, that our baseline is also moving, huh? because when we thought about the agenda in 2013, uh, 14, and 15, we were looking at uh, our projection of the world 2030. And this projection is changing, in particular in the, in the labor markets. Now, so uh, as you know, we are facing a very accelerated uh, 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 in structural uh, uh, movements with respect to not only technology, but also demography and, uh, 
and, and climate change, and this is affecting the way we organize ourselves. Yeah? So those, then we need to ask ourselves, what can we done, can, can be done uh, within this framework to perhaps rethink uh, our agenda and, 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 and do some corrections uh, in terms of policies? And I, I'd just like to finish by highlighting that, of course, this is the, the main reflection that we are having now at the ILO as part of our centenary. We just uh, uh, launched a, 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 a major report of the Global Commission on the Future of Work that actually uh, uh, gives some insights on how to, 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 to rebuild this uh, social contract and how to be back on track in terms of achieving this work for all. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Vinicius. That was not a very encouraging picture. I'm wondering if you have any good news <laughs> for us. Um, Paul, we'll turn to you. Paul Ladd is the director of the, the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, UNRISID, uh, based in Geneva. Paul, you have the floor. Microphone, please, for the speaker. Yeah. There we go. Thank you and thank you. Uh, to the presenters from the RECs and uh, for the presentation from Ma, who, think, who I think comprehensively covered many of the issues that I wanted to uh, reflect on, particularly in terms of the, the scope of the recommendations on how we can strengthen social protection and uh, reduce inequality. Before, before I turn to that, I just wanted to uh, give an advertisement really for uh, the conference that UNRIST hosted last year in November in Geneva, which Elliot also participated in, uh, which looked at uh, overcoming inequalities in a fractured world. Uh, we entitled it Between Elite Power and Social Mobilization. Uh, we issued a call for papers in our academic networks and through that we generated a thousand submissions of people that wanted to contribute to that debate and they were based from all around the world of different ages we had a uh, excellent gender uh, balance and we gave nine panels we talked about 43 papers we had keynote addresses by Vandana Shiva and Francois Bourguignon and many other distinguished uh, academics and collectively we considered really the overlap and the reinforcing of different types of inequalities the vertical inequalities that we've heard talked about today in terms of income and wealth, but also the horizontal inequalities related to gender, uh, ethnicity, disability, age, etc., uh, status, uh, migrant status. We also talked about geographical and spatial inequalities, in particular how they related to urban areas and cities. That's all I'm going to say on the conference because I brought with me uh, an eight-page policy brief which I'd like to share with you. I've got copies here and if you'd like to pick those up from me at the end, I'll gladly uh, give them to you. But now just turning to the scope of the policy recommendations that we've heard talked about by the various uh, presenters today. So the first cluster is around social protection and the importance of social protection in reducing inequalities. And UNRIST has typically approached social policy and social protection as a, a comprehensive issue that relates not just to the provision of social services, health, education, housing, water and sanitation, but also connects to the labor market, as Alicia mentioned, and also the reproductive uh, e economy, if you like, the reproductive rights of women and how they interact in the labor market and relate to social policy. So we're talking collectively about child benefits, pensions, social assistance, unemployment benefits, uh, labor market policies, and maternity benefits. And these are important because they can promote the social mobility and reduce economic insecurity associated with the changes of risks that people face as they move through uh, their lives. Now, for us, we've tended to come down on the side of universal social protection policies and universal social policy because the costs associated with targeting administratively can be quite high and also people change they slip in and out of different opportunities they move up and down so trying to pin them down at a level of vulnerability through which they receive benefits is not really efficient and this can help prevent people from falling into poverty and the need for a safety net we want to keep them in the labor market we want to keep them receiving uh, the the social uh, services that they uh, need and want. 
The, so the second cluster is around on fiscal policy. And I think it was captured quite eloquently by the panelists in terms of the need for progressive tax policies. Now, our existing suite of tools concentrates on personal income tax, corporate tax, and sales tax. But of course, and I think we heard it mentioned, we also need to look at the gaps that we have because of a failure to cooperate properly on global taxation. So with tax evasion, tax avoidance, the mistransfer of uh, uh, pricing of trade, all of these contribute to a deficit in resources and fiscal space, particularly for low-income countries, and then inhibit the ability to put in place social protection systems, which would also reduce inequalities in their own right. And in addition to that, there is a growing, vibrant debate on wealth taxes. You know, you've got uh, an obscene concentration of wealth in uh, billionaires in, in, on the one side, in a good way, in all parts of the world, and yet in another way, concentrating wealth in a way that will never be spent, in a way that enhances human capital and in, enhances human uh, potential. So looking at the full suite of fiscal policies available both nationally and internationally to increase our ability to bring people into society and into the economy. We also heard about wage policies and labor market policies, and I think uh, we had it mentioned uh, the importance of a minimum living wage that's accredited by a local body and that employers can ascribe to. The other thing I would add to that, and we do a lot of research on this, is different ownership models in the private sector where employees have a share of the business. It increases their incentives to add to the uh, you know, growth of that business, and of course they take a greater share of profit. So I'm talking about social and solidarity enterprise economies, cooperatives, etc. So it's not just about wages that people take home, it's really about their own share and ownership also of the capital in business too. I wanted to conclude that suite of policies with a mention of fair and inclusive institutions at all levels. So politically, it's important that people have a voice so that they can influence the evolution of their economic sector and their engagement in it. It's important so that they can influence the evolution of the response to climate change and environmental degradation. And Mr. Speaker, let me just conclude with a, a brief uh, reprise on some of the other challenges that will be coming very soon in the future that are also going to open up new frontiers on inequality. And we've heard them. They are demography. Sorry, I missed the last sentence there. It sounded good. <laughs> Technology, climate change, and uh, a demography. Right, thank, thank you very much, Paul. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the featured speakers. We've had the panelists, excellent interventions from three regional commissions, and from UNDP, we've had our two lead discussants. We're going to open the floor now and ask you all to uh, intervene Please press your microphones. That will put you into the queue, and uh, it registers here, so we'll know. Ah, somebody's censoring us. We'll ask that you please identify yourselves um, by name and institution, and try to keep your interventions as short and brief as, we, uh, as possible so that we can accommodate as many. We've had some rather interesting perspectives, different perspectives on the question of inequality. We've had the... Um, the emphasis placed by Alethea Marsena on disaggregating the overall numbers so that one can see the different degrees to which different groups in the population may be affected by inequality. We've had a very clear presentation of the different types of inequalities that can be, that can be prevalent, not just inequalities of income and wealth, but also of access to opportunity, of access to basic services. We've heard about the distinctions between different demographic groups from Munir in um, Esquire, the particular problems of youth and of aging, as well as the complications posed by conflict on the ability of, of countries and regions to uh, make social progress. But there are a couple of other things that I'd like to throw out as well as you, uh, as you prepare your interventions. One is that we have hardly spoken about the intergenerational transmission of, of poverty that inequality causes, that 
the, the fact that one is in, inequitable, uh, that the distribution of wealth is inequitable, tends to ensure that the next generation of those who are not as well advantaged are as disadvantaged or even more so um, as, as they come into, into their own. Uh, secondly, we speak a lot about the use of fiscal policies to address inequality, but we've heard that there are indeed very severe limitations on the fiscal space that many countries have at their disposal. But to that I would also add, um, we should also consider the extent to which fiscal policies, wage policies, can be as effective as we expect them or want them to be if we're dealing with highly informal structures, if we have economies where many people are employed, if at all, in the informal sector where small and medium enterprises are perhaps unknown to the fiscal authorities and where the capacities of the fiscal administrations themselves are not all that highly developed. Uh, to this comes, um, Paul, made the, the <coughs> sorry, Paul made the reference to the preference for universal uh, social protection policies because of the cost of targeting. But just um, yesterday we mentioned the, the problem of legal identity. There is a real shortcoming in many developing countries that people do not have the way, uh, the, the opportunity or the means to prove their identity, which means targeting becomes extremely difficult and even more costly than in, in other circumstances. So under these um, issues, the, the question then arises of not just what policy one has to use in the, in the area of fiscal or wage, but what mix and combination of policies has to be deployed to take into account the specific circumstances of a given society. So I've ranted on long enough. Um, the floor is open. I recognize first the distinguished representative of the Syrian Ab Arab Republic. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to mention here that cooperation between the Syrian Arab Republic and ISQA is a very close cooperation, especially following the signing of the agreement between Syria and the International Planning Commission and ISQA. Syrian Arab Republic built with ISQA a progressive and advanced relationship and completed many projects before the launch of the terrorist war against Syria. Also, Syria supports uh, all these endeavors. Uh, Mr. Moderator, we would like to stress the pivotal role of the United Nations agencies, especially ISQA, as they draw attention to the danger of uh, unilateral economic sanctions imposed by the West against Syria, and that uh, inflicts harm on the Syrian uh, people and the whole country, indeed the whole region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I give the floor now to the distinguished representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank the panelists for such interesting presentations. Mr. Chair, uh, in Brazil, the adoption of cross-cutting social policies in health and education has had positive impact in fighting inequalities. The establishment of and consolidation of uni a unified health system since 1998, 1988 has provided free health coverage for all Brazilians. The expansion across the country of primary, secondary, and, and university education, including through free tuition, scholarships, and subsidized student loans, has also contributed to this objective. Likewise, target social programs implemented by different governments over the course of the last couple of decades have had meaningful results. Should be highlighted, however, that more government is not always necessarily the answer to address inequality. A key priority for the Brazilian government is pension and retirement system reform. The current regulations tend to benefit disproportionately high-earning civil servants and private sector employees. By bringing the Brazilian pension and retirement system into line with international norms, the government will reduce inequality, promote social equity, and liberate fiscal resources for investing in those in need. The government has also to further implement labor market reform to address current labor rigidities and to reduce unemployment while preserving core labor rights and standards. Those measures should contribute to lower labor costs to companies, increase employment for workers, and ultimately raise, ra raise wages across the board in the economy. 
The same logic applies to government initiatives to streamline regulation, promote public-private partnerships and infrastructure projects, and privatize state companies. Such measures should lower transaction costs, foster private investment, and rationalize public expenditure, free up resources to finance core government functions, such as education, public security, and health. The proposal, the proposed legal institution framework under construction in Brazil places the private sector squarely on the driver's seat with a view to promoting growth, investment, and employment. The new priority of the government in the fight against corruption and crime should also disproportionately favor the poor and the disenfranchised, which are often the main groups affected by such illegal activities. Mr. Chair, the Brazilian government reaffirms its commitment to social inclusion and to overcoming social inequality while upholding its determination to meet long-term budgetary discipline for overall public expenditures. I thank you. Thank you very much. I turn now to the distinguished representative of Mexico. Muchas gracias, eh, señor subsecretario. Eh, agradecer todas las presentaciones del... Thank you very much indeed for all of these presentations, particularly those this made by Alicia Barthena, who reminded us of the importance of stepping up the work of the Commission. And we are now very much looking forward to the Secretary General's report on the reform as pertains to our region. A question I'd like to raise to Madame Barthena. who indeed reflected this double exclusion. This indeed reminds me of one thing. We are cooperating with a clerk and we are also working with uh, neighboring countries in Central America. And this is why I would like some detail from Madame, Bar Madame Barsena on the on social inclusion, particularly when we are talking about migrants. And what is the case then for countries of transit and host countries and countries of origin of migrants? Second uh, comment I'd like to make, Mexico is one of the uh, members of the Group of Friends of Older Persons. In the second presentation, reference was made to persons with disabilities. But in terms that I didn't see, believe to be correct, there is an expression that is used, and so I would like to say in correct in the presentation that was made I'd like the expression to be corrected I know full well that there are people who do use old terminology and old expressions to refer to persons with disabilities but we must update the terminology used and the expression used and so I hope for the work plan for next year you will refer to these people in the correct fashion. Perhaps based on the development plan for persons of, with uh, persons with disabilities, apologies for touching on such a technical issue, but I think it's very important to mention that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. I turn now to the, the distinguished representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> um, I'm happy that Kave, Mr. Kavazayadi mentioned that we have a lot of billionaires in our region. Um, and you know that what well, Time magazine last week mentioned that 1% of the population of the world owns 47% of the whole wealth of the world and could own 64% by 2030. If the international community is not going to react in time and in full force. Um, that's a comment to that, but my question is about the toolbox 
and it was really enthusiastic to see that there is a toolbox in your website since I'm from the ESCAP region. Um, I'm very much interested in concrete examples. Um, this morning, in the, in the panel this morning, we have mentioned about the concrete examples and the important role uh, that these uh, models can play. I was trying to go through the uh, toolbox right now on my cell phone and I couldn't find it. That's why I'm raising this question to you. Um, I would like to know how disability inclusive is this toolbox. Are persons with psychosocial mental disabilities also included or mentioned? Um, I have seen there are 100 or more than 100 examples of good practices around the world are mentioned in the toolbox, which is very much um, a matter of praise. And I believe that's the policy that we have mentioned this morning that instead of naming and shaving in human rights, we are naming and praising good practices. And that's very much uh, a positive and constructive behavior. Um, and I know that's, that's a very detailed question maybe to ask, but I, uh, if there are available such information, I would be more than happy to be informed about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'll take one more intervention from the member states and then I'll come back to the panel perhaps and uh, have the panelists re re respond to some of the direct questions or to what they may have heard from the other panelists. So I recognize now the distinguished representative of Finland. Mr. Moderator, um, our country is very happy to hear about talks about the Nordic model and the good cycle we have in the, in the welfare system. Our ambassador in our official speech yesterday t t told everyone that uh, Finnish are happy taxpayers. We have a high tax rate, but we pay them gladly because we have a good cycle uh, of, of welfare state and economy. So, so there is a large uh, for example, almost all the panelists told today that uh, uh, if you invest in schools, in social security systems, social um, benefits, safety nets, uh, it creates healthy, skillful workforce, which of course I um, is needed for economic growth. And, and then the economic growth uh, enables to, to uphold the welfare state system. Uh, and it, it's interesting to hear almost in every international meeting that this system of economy of well-being is, is valued, but it's very much challenged uh, in our own countries. We have the same discussion that we have uh, too high taxes, we have, uh, uh, we have problems <coughs> of understanding our social security system of, of over 100 benefits. Uh, which interact in a way that no one understands. And um, of course, we have our own wicked problems of, of intergenerational poverty. We have whole families without uh, children, parents ha having been working for, for decades. And, uh, and the, our answer to these questions is the, is the integration of services. We need the school system, uh, youth services, social services, benefit system, employment services, to work together in order to solve these problems. And this is very difficult, I must say. Um, and, um, but uh, to conclude, it's, it, we are building this economy of well-being, and it's also one of our priorities during the EU presidency Finland has the last half of this year. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn back now to the, the panelists. Um, are there any of you would like to react either to the questions that were asked to you directly? Munir, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I, I actually want to address the issue of the intergenerational transmission of inequality. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have much better news. Um, in conflict areas, um, we are seeing significant problems arising from long-term exposure to violence, including uh, stunting and negative cognitive development, which will produce a generation that is less productive as we move forward 
into the uh, into the uh, you know, next generation. Obviously, breaking this cycle requires significant investments, shift in allocation of resources, the fiscal allocation that we've spoken about, reform of the labor market, a significant increase in private sector development that is job creating and respectful of the environment. And this is where the Agenda 2030 as a holistic approach comes in extremely useful as a guide as to how to move uh, forward. But clearly, breaking the cycle of intergenerational transmission of, uh, um, of inequality is the challenge at hand. And I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, remark made by the representative of Mexico on using more appropriate terms on the persons with disability, and we'll certainly take that into account. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, t for all of the interventions and, and questions. Uh, let, let, let me pick up uh, where Munir left off on, on the issue of intergenerational inequality. Uh, yes, of, of course, uh, uh, Elliot, what you mentioned is, is correct. Um, but addressing it isn't only through the sort of the, the fiscal area, right? I mean, uh, uh, children's nutrition is probably one of the best ways of addressing intergenerational inequality. Or, or women's education is one of the most important factors, more important than wealth, to avoid stunting among children. So the, invest the investment that I mentioned, the investment... In, in, in people brings these multiple benefits, including in an intergenerational sense. And it is quite shocking that it, when you look at Asia Pacific, even quite wealthy parts of our region, like Southeast Asia, the issue of, 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 of nutrition and stunting is, 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 is still quite high. Uh, let me turn to, to the, the, the people uh, with, with, with disabilities. You know, uh, Almost 700 million people in Asia Pacific have some form of, of disability. So leaving no one behind means we absolutely have to have policies that, that, that bring into sharp focus the needs of, 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 of this community. And Asia Pacific was actually the first region in the world to, to, to move on this. Uh, we, we have the Incheon strategy that, 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 that was adopted uh, over a decade ago, it was really the first disability-inclusive development agenda in the world with very specific goals, very specific uh, targets. So I, I think that's, that, that's, that's, that's really part of, of our, uh, our intergovernmental processes, and, and we have been supporting countries with turning that into, into action. Uh, on the toolbox uh, itself, actually, there is a, a tab, but it's going to be hard to see on your, on your phone. So there is a tab which shows the disability schemes to be able to, 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 to look at that. Uh, let me finish, Elliot, by, by just, just saying that fiscal space is, is, of course, very important. We know that tax-to-GDP ratios are low in many of our, our countries. But our analysis shows that public spending on education, health, and social protection is not necessarily linked to higher GDP. Some of our countries with lower levels of GDP are spending higher levels on social protection, on education, whether it's Timor-Leste, whether it's Vietnam, you see whether it's Mongolia, you see some, some high spending. It is to some degree also a policy choice, not only about fiscal uh, space. And I think they have made this policy choice, many of these countries, because they have begun to look at this as an investment. And that becomes increasingly, I think, important as the economies, certainly in Asia Pacific, begin to slow down. As economic growth begins to slow down, actually investment in social protection is another way of injecting some more momentum into the economy, as well as, of course, bringing the many other benefits that we have talked uh, about on this, on this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Kabe. Uh, Abdullah, would you like to intervene on this, or just two words to to, to share what, what what this discussion has given me as an inspiration? I mean, listening to the perspective of like Mexico and Brazil and other countries, you see emerging a clear template or even algorithm on how we can deal with the question of inequalities. Uh, three sets of avenues: uh, first, a, a, a minimum floor spending on uh, yeah, that's quite critical. Uh, uh, second, uh, or rather third, I'll come to second, uh, we cannot not uh, invest in uh, having higher tax to higher fortunes. 
uh, higher revenues. Uh, this is absolutely important because otherwise um, uh, the, the gap between revenues will distract or dis disrupt uh, the social contract, and that's that's very critical in a society. But number number two, um, um, targeted targeted social investment in um, sectors like education and health. I think this template is extremely critical to deal with. Um, have a dent on, on, on reducing inequalities. Uh, but that's not enough. And I, I, I let me build on Iran's um, uh, questions. Um, we have to deconstruct further the concept of leave no one behind to be more targeting in our exp expenditure, expenditure. We in UNDP, uh, not only our own program, but we are supporting countries to de deconstruct that. That's why all our programs, are, they have what we call LNOB markers uh, in details format. We could tell you for each program portfolio what's the impact on disabilities. Mm -hmm. There's a, a disability marker, uh, the impact on youth, uh, the impact on uh, on gender, and so on and so forth. I think LNOB uh, uh, leave no one behind is so an aggregation that it may not be policy operational if you don't deconstruct it. Uh, coming in your 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 th your question. Mr. Moderator, on the, um, on the uh, intergenerational inequality, what economists call the, uh, the Great Gatsby Syndrome. Uh, targeted inequality will deal with it, but I think we have to address properly what we call, uh, you called in your introduction, the uh, horizontal inequalities. If I, if I, and, and for that, governance is extremely important. I was giving you a teaser on our upcoming report. We show that gaps in governance are extremely um, uh, detrimental in dealing with the question of inequalities. If I take the case of Africa, we have deconstructed the, uh, the, the, uh, the Gini coefficients, and you could see it's, a, it's an exercise that we have done with OECD. 80% of inequalities is partial inequalities. Uh, it's coming from the uh, neglected, ungoverned spaces. And if you don't invest in those peripheries, uh, not only you will never deal with the generational uh, inequalities, but you'll be investing on war rather than investing on peace. Uh, that I really wanted to put that. I always uh, uh, quote uh, uh, Lao Tzu who say that uh, war horses are a bead in the frontiers. If you neglect your frontiers, no wonder you have war. Thank you, Abdullahi. Um, Alicia Barsin, are, are you still with us? I don't see your your picture, but I, I'm hoping you're Yes, I'm here. That. Excellent. Can I yes. turn to you then? I, I think there were two questions directly to you, one from, uh, from Mexico, I think, both of them. No? Sí. Uh, so let me answer in Spanish, if I may. Um, quisiera agradecerle. I'd like to thank the delegate of Mexico. Thank you very much for your statement. I think there are a number of topics that you addressed that I think are very important. First, how the regional commissions can contribute to the knowledge, the data, the statistics on this matter of exclusion, social exclusion, and of course inequality. And we have a database in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean, the information comes from population centers, uh, home surveys, and all of which yield very important information to know what's happening at the home level, the, the household level, above and beyond individuals. And I think that that information, first-hand information, is what we're using to look at the social panorama that we publish every year. And it's available to you as well. And I'd also like to highlight that we organize and the interpreter points out that the speech is coming cutting out words are coming and going not possible to interpret dado a la cepal que hagamos tres cosas que con gusto estamos haciendo por un lado por supuesto que documentar la desigualdad there's an element the, the interpreter would like to point out that the speaker has the interpretation coming out on, 
on speakerphone. When I speak, I can hear it in the background. If she could turn me off. Una materia de política Alicia. económica y social. Alicia. Por lo tanto, estamos Alicia, proponiendo una me? nueva generación de políticas sociales que eh, estamos obviamente tomando como base las experiencias mismas de los gobiernos que vayan, por ejemplo, eh, de, las, de las transferencias condicionadas que han sido... I'll try again. The problem is I can hear a voice in the background echoing. I know. Let's try again. So... This is not necessarily conditioned to nutrition and health. It goes a little bit beyond the topic of education, secondary education, for instance, which is an issue in Latin America. The new generation of social policies go are being used by an observatory. We have a web page that shows how we are implementing policies in different countries. What is each country doing to solve its problems. And we've seen that there's been evolution in minimum wages, uh, unemployment protection, training. These are what we call labor policies. And we also see evolution in the area of social policies. What are countries doing to make progress? And what's the next milestone that we can achieve? You asked a very specific question about Central America, and I can say that ECLAC was invited by the government of Mexico and the three countries called the Northern Triangle, Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, to prepare an integrated so development program so that the issue of migration, which is very relevant and topical right now, and which is based on the migration compact, which looks at the migration cycle from the very the country of origin, the transit countries, and the destination country. We in the ECLAC countries are working on the origin countries. What are the deep-seated causes of migration? And we've seen four fundamental causes. One is clearly unemployment. Who are the people that migrate? It's young people between 15 and 29 years of age. The second cause of migration is violence. Violence, which has very much hit countries like Honduras, Salvador, and Guatemala, and Mexico, no doubt. And the third cause is family reunification. People want to go to be with their families. Many of these migrants have family members who are in the United States. And the four cause is climate change. We've seen that in Honduras, for instance, especially in this northern triangle, the dry triangle as it's known, many of these countries have suffered from climate change, especially their crops, corn and coffee. And this is a cause of migration. And then, of course, there's the issue of rural poverty. Guatemala has a 77% rate of poverty rate, 82 in Honduras and Salvador, 49% rural poverty. So the young people migrate from those areas. We've produced a number of documents that are available to you here. The first one is about migration in the northern Central American countries. We did this with FAO and ECLAC. The second pamphlet is this integrated program that uh, we presented to the four governments, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And then we did a deep analysis of all Central America, including the Dominican Republic, to look at the larger themes and the big challenges in the region. Let me give you an example. Central America exports to Mexico only 5% of its total exports. I think Mexico could benefit much more from exports with Central America. And this is a topic that we're addressing with the new government in Mexico, where we believe that it's possible to provide incentives, for example, for trade and exports and imports as well between Mexico and Central America. And that could be a big driver for progress. Now, why is this happening? The main cause of low exports from Central America to Mexico is the issue of trade facilities. It's not about tariffs because there is a free trade agreement between these countries. It's, it's the issue of non-tariff barriers, barriers which are about facilitating tra trade, transport, customs, phytosanitary regulations, 
so there's a great area of work there. It's not costly to address this, and it could alleviate problems, and it could help Central America and Mexico. So we're working very closely with SICA, the center, uh, the system for Central American integration, because we believe that reforming and development, we ha in doing so, we need to look at the organizations that already exist in our region, like CARICOM and like SICA, and we can work very closely with them. As we see in the Asia-Pacific region, they work with the Asian group, for example, and sub-regional organizations. So you member states will be very soon reviewing the assets in the various regions, and I think we think we are a great asset. We work with you, and we respond to the demands of countries to us. And then, of course, we have we have we have convening power we have a think tank training we generate knowledge statistics and new ideas and of course we're here to provide technical assistance when member states require it back to you elliot thank you alicia um i'm going to go back out now to the to the audience uh, for a second round of interventions um but i'm going to throw out a question to you as well um at the time of that global economic and financial crisis in, in 2008, um, there, there was a severe downturn in, in economic performance around the world. But after the dust had settled, we found that countries that had in place social protection systems were less affected by the economic downturn. The impact on employment, the impact on overall growth was much less severe than it was in countries with less well-developed uh, uh, well and, and sophisticated social protection systems. So that is another function of social protection that we have not discussed today, which is that it contributes to enhancing the resilience of individuals to the types of shocks that have continually plagued our, our societies. Uh, is that something that we should be taking into account when we look at inequality, um, that this is something that can be used? The, approach to dealing with inequality at the same time can also be used to enhance individual resilience to shocks because that is one of the things that helps us to secure the gains in terms of poverty reduction and overall social advancement. And Munir was speaking about how uh, in some countries of his region the, the gains from the MDG period are being lost in part due to the, to the conflict question. So this is an issue that I'd like to throw out as well in case someone would like to react to it. I will turn now to the uh, representative of the Food and Agriculture Organization. Carla, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Moderator, I'm really very pleased to join to this important conversation and, of course, share FAO perspective. Let me also thank uh, uh, Madame, Madame Chair, uh, Madame Chairperson, and all the panelists and the lead uh, discussants. Uh, I would like to, to start by really recalling that uh, while we continue to, to see rapid urbanization and the issue of demography was also mentioned in this discussion in the world, the rural uh, people are at the risk of being left behind. They are three times, of course, more likely to be poor and uh, have lower wages than their urban counterparts. And uh, only one uh, of five agricultural workers have access to basic social protection. Uh, there is uh, therefore really a need to, to invest more to, to transform rural areas and promote rural urban linkages that uh, benefit uh, communities in the rural villages and cities. A fiscal wage and social protection policy are therefore really central elements uh, of this effort. Uh, of course, uh, we have mentioned all of, that, all of this. Uh, FAO in particular consider social protection uh, as a critical component to, to reduce rural poverty. It, it is a, a needed but often absent buffer that uh, would prevent rural families from failing into a downward spiral of, uh, of poverty and exclusion uh, when they are hit particularly by economic or climate shocks. But uh, they must be combined, of course, with the productive policies uh, for long-term results in uh, overcoming poverty. Uh, we have seen how 
uh, those are some of the examples, how linking productive investments with social protection schemes can uh, create a virtuous cycle of local development, accelerating efforts to reach zero hunger, for instance, sustainable development, and uh, build the resilient and rural livelihoods. This is an important uh, policy innovation, I would say, that has gained uh, traction in recent years and uh, delivered concrete results in different parts of the world. For example, local food purchase from family farming is a very good example of linking social and productive policy. Imp and it, it has been implemented in several countries, for instance, in Latin America, we have heard that from the panelists, and also the Caribbeans, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa, with results and often supported by South-South cooperation. This is something that I also wanted to highlight that maybe was not referred before. I would like also to emphasize that uh, there is not only a ma social protection is not really a matter of uh, only of social justice, but it is an essential investment to help vulnerable, excluded, poor family, and especially women and youth to effectively contribute to local economic uh, development. Therefore, it is really our strong belief that uh, achieving 2030 agenda requires a strong focus in addressing inequalities and social ex exclusion. We have to ensure access uh, by rural families to essential services and give them the means to overcome barriers in order to, to, to build the sustainable, productive, and, and the resilient uh, livelihoods. I thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. I'm going to give the floor now to representatives of uh, three ECOSOC accredited NGOs who've, who've uh, registered to speak. I turn first to the representative of the Congregations of St. Joseph. Sorry, could you give the seat, number? seat number is 2755. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you to the panelists for sharing your insights this afternoon. My name is Sue Wilson, and I'm representing the Congregations of St. Joseph. I would like to focus on the trend of weak fiscal capacity for addressing inequality. The 2018 World Inequality Report makes the point that economic inequality is largely driven by unequal ownership of capital, which can be either privately or publicly owned. The report shows that since 1980, very large transfers of public to private wealth have occurred in nearly all countries whether rich or emerging. Over the past decades, total wealth within countries has increased, but governments have become poorer. This trend limits the ability of governments to tackle inequality. It has important implications for a government's capacity to provide social protections, and it pushes governments toward private-public partnerships. From the panel, I heard recommendations to combat tax evasion and use more progressive tax rates for individuals and corporations as ways of strengthening fiscal capacity for governments. My questions are, since this lack of fiscal capacity is a global trend, can you identify intergovernmental measures for increasing fiscal capacity? In particular, do you see some form of a Tobin tax, a small tax on financial transactions, as an effective intergovernmental measure? And finally, what measures do you recommend to ensure private sector participation in social protection systems complies with the human rights criteria of availability, accessibility, and affordability, as well as quality? and does not discriminate by gender or any other characteristics. Thank you. Thank you very much. I give the floor now to the representative of Soroptimist International in seat 2753. Madam Chair, Mr. Moderator, and panelists, my name is Sharon Fisher, and I am representing Soroptimist International. Civil society stands ready, as stated in the Civil Society Declaration, to complement and help shape state efforts at every turn, providing a grassroots perspective on program design, empowering people to participate and have a voice, unleashing the capacity of ordinary people to be creative agents of change in their own communities, 
and in their well-being. While the private sector may have a role to play, we must be cautious that one's well-being is not directly connected to turning a profit. National governments must take primary responsibility and international bodies set the standards and ensure implementation. At the CSW regional prep meeting happening today and tomorrow, led by SCAP and UN Women, civil society has prepared recommendations and considerations on social protection systems. I would like to share a few of the recommendations from RCM, TWG, GEEW, including optimize fiscal expenditures for gender responsive social protection and care infrastructure, such as equitable, quality, accessible, and affordable early childhood education, child care, elder care, health care, and social services for persons with disabilities and persons living with HIV and AIDS, which meet the needs of both caregivers and those in need of care, bearing in mind that social protection policies also play a critical role in reducing poverty and inequality and supporting inclusive growth and gender equality. Promote the value of work by workers in the care sector and the skills required, including through national advocacy campaigns to address cultural norms and attitudes. In particular, protect the labor and human rights of care workers, including by ensuring their fair wages, social security, and pension schemes. Ensure formal and informal workers access to social protection, including occupational injury, disability insurance, paid sick leave, occupational health and safety, health, pension, and unemployment provisioning. Support employers and workers' organizations in advancing the implementation of work-family balance, including maternity protection and paternity leave. And I will end with a challenge to all the panelists, member states, and the UN to integrate the 10 commitments of the Copenhagen Declaration as you develop plans to implement the SDGs and Agenda 2030. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And finally, I turn to the representative of International Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse in seat 2756. Thank you very much. My name is Catherine Klein, and as was stated, I'm a representative of International Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse, but I'm speaking more broadly. And a number of panelists today have recommended a need to change the way we deal with older persons or see us and persons with disabilities from that of a beneficiary model to one that sees us as actively engaged, continue to work, both earning more money after 60, 65, and certainly contributing our unpaid labor. So my question is, can any of you offer any examples of where and how this is happening? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Um, are there any other um, interventions from the floor, from member states, other organizations, UN colleagues? Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we believe that uh, government expenditures are very essential in ensuring that social protection is implemented across a broad stretch of the population. And this has enabled the uh, countries to provide better social services, health, education, etc., plus uh, social insurance coverage. But the private sector can also be tapped to enhance the available funds for social, uh, social protection systems. In the case of the Philippines, we have tapped the private sector, uh, especially cooperatives and the mutual benefit associations, which have over 20 million members, and they have bought uh, insurance schemes from uh, regulated uh, insurance companies for their members. And this has helped us in raising the, uh, the percentage of the population covered by social insurance to about a third of the population. Also, uh, we can tap uh, private sector funds uh, for microfinance. For instance, the case of microfinance NGOs, which are regulated in the Philippines, they uh, provide uh, uh, about 70% of the one billion uh, lending that they're providing for microfinance enterprises. 
uh, for uh, micro enterprises. And this has helped the Philippines attain a growth rate of 6.5% uh, during the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there are no further interventions, I'll come back to the panel. Uh, is Alicia there? Okay, um, Alicia, please intervene if, you, if you'd like to uh, chime in, if you're still with us. But uh, let me um, turn back to the panel in general. Um, Abdullahi, Kave, Munir, would either of any of you uh, wish to intervene on what we've heard from the floor since your last round? Uh, thank you. I think the floor is pushing us to our last retreat to come back. That's, like a, that's why I like the interaction, interactivity of these discussions. Um, let, me, let me comment on the Tobin tax, but let me preamble it a little bit. Uh, first of all, it's, it's very difficult. You remember uh, when, when President Jacques Chirac was, of France was leading the G70, he tried it, but uh, it was attacked left and right. But I, I, I understand that uh, in the next G20 that will be led by Japan, the idea will be put back on the table. Um, I don't know if it will have the same fate that uh, the wood gave it uh, when, when Chirac tried it. But I think uh, we, we may be better off uh, uh, shifting our energy to uh, dealing with the leakages of resources uh, that exist in the system, which I call undue taxes. First, uh, we discussed it, the illicit financial flow. When you just look at the uh, trade-related illicit financial flow, we have calculated that uh, many studies have shown that LDCs are losing, have lost in the last 10 years, $1.9 trillion of illicit financial flow. This is huge. Um, and most of these flows are dormant, are, are staying in the um, fiscal paradise, as they call it. That's why I think the international community, the G7 and the G20, must have, must put forward a more transparent and equitable uh, global governance tax system. If we don't do it, that leakage cannot stop. I think that can be a big bang, and in my estimation, even more powerful than the Tobin tax uh, to deal with it. Returning that flow of money to fund needed investment. One. Uh, second, those are the illicit financial flows. We have to deal with the not at all flowing financial flows. Uh, by that, I mean the, that in many countries, and I said it when I say that um, uh, average uh, fiscal pressure in developing countries is between 13 and 17 percent, but most of them are 9 percent, and I don't want to name countries here. You have countries that produce oil, or produce oil producing countries that have only 9 percent fiscal pressure. Uh, where is the money going? It means people are not ta paying taxes. So having the fiscal civism or discipline that we have in Finland, for instance, is something that must be a must uh, for, for countries to fund their own uh, social development. That is extremely important. The third category where we need to really work on is that the world is not short of resources. Uh, we may not have the right uh, policy instruments or financial instruments to get those resources. We have, in many countries, uh, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, insurance funds, but because of lack of the appropriate uh, financial instrument, we are not tapping into those resources. Yes, for a uh, Tobin task, uh, uh, tax, I doubt that the world is ready to vote to sign off on it, but that shouldn't be a reason not to tap into huge potential um, pool of resources that exists in the world to finance development. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, Kavi, over to you. Thank you, uh, Elliot. I'm glad I don't have to uh, address the Tobin tax issue. That's, that's been taken care of. Um, but, but I think I'll just, just, just to extend the, the, the conversation on tax, you know, tax revenue in, in, in the Asia-Pacific region is low. Um, but more problematic is that most of the taxes that are collected actually come from VAT. Which, which, which is not a tax on wealth, which is not a tax on, on, on enterprise. So it doesn't really tap into the, you know, the billionaires that we talked about, uh, et cetera. And, and, and VAT is not a progressive tax, right? So, so the impact on, on, on the poor is not what you would, you would wish to advocate. So our starting point is, is, is so 
different. Tobin tax is, is, is like uh, it feels it's 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 way beyond. It's it's like you know for we we're still trying to crawl in the tax space, and uh, and, and Tobin tax is somewhere in the sprint region. Um, the second thing is, is maybe if, if I could just touch on the, the aging issue, because this is, this is very fundamental. In Asia-Pacific, uh, aging is becoming a major issue. Uh, we, we have our countries, the populations are aging in, in record time. You know, in, in, uh, we, I keep mentioning this example that in, in countries like France, it took about over 100 years to go from uh, aging to aged. Within our countries, this, a, this phenomenon is happening in, 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 in 15 years, in 20 years. So it's a much, much less uh, smaller window to, to, to react to it. And, and in, in addition to that, you know, countries are becoming poor, uh, sorry, countries are becoming old before they become rich, right? So again, the means to address aging is, is different. Now, now it's, it's, it's a vital part of, of, our, of our economic growth to maintain uh, uh, older populations as part of the workforce. This is a necessity, and we've seen it in, in countries uh, like Japan that, in a way, are, are showing us what, what the future in many other parts of our region uh, might look like. And doing that, that is driven by policy. That, 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 that is very, very clear to us. Um, but it's not just a, an economic case uh, that, 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 that sort of uh, pushes us in that direction. What we're seeing in, in Asia Pacific also is that poverty rates amongst the aged populations are increasing, even in uh, countries which, which are you know, the, more, the more developed countries in, in Asia Pacific. So we see a, the rates of poverty are on the rise for that population group, which, which makes it fundamental uh, to bring in the, the, the policies uh, that we've talked about, including the social protection, including the inclusion in the workforce. Um, and then the lastly, uh, uh, thank you for, to the colleague for mentioning the, the, the work on, 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 on gender, the gender dimension in, in all of this and, and, and the, the recommendations that are emanating from, from that process. Obviously, uh, the gender lens is going to be a vital one because when you look at aging populations or indeed disabled populations, in any of the vulnerable groups that we mentioned, when you add the gender lens, that's an additional dimension. So you find that uh, that that, that uh, uh, women within within older women are, are more disadvantaged. That women who are disabled are more disadvantaged. So it, it's it's a vital element to bring and to address through very specific targeted policies like gender inclusive budgeting. So so thank you for for bringing that to our attention. Thank you very much, Munir. Yes, um, I also would like to address the, um, the taxation issues. I think we have to realize that we are not necessarily in the best uh, global context of multilateral cooperation, specifically on the issue of multilateral cooperation on tax issues. We are finding challenges on climate change. We're finding challenges on, uh, in terms of multilateral cooperation on peacekeeping and on other issues, political uh, and and uh, conflicts, so it may be it may, we may not be necessarily at the right historical moment to address um, multilateral cooperation on on fiscal issues. And this being said, um, in the fall of this uh, past year, uh, ESQUA and the group of seventy seven plus China held an international conference in Beirut on specifically on illicit financial flows. Uh, as part of the Financing for Development agenda. And we have uh, clearly indicated uh, the losses to the world through illicit uh, financing uh, flows. In the Arab region, for every dollar that uh, comes into the region, there are three dollars that goes out of the region uh, through investments, through uh, illicit uh, flows. And I want to concur uh, with uh, Mar the importance of curbing illicit flows, one, curbing uh, corruption as a second important source of um, enhancing financing for development in, and as, a, as opposed to uh, taxes at this stage. Obviously, most states are seized by the challenge of creating jobs for their populations and are uh, attracting investments, job-creating investments, and capital investments in their countries 
with the hope of creating jobs and um, lowering both environmental uh, kind of criteria as well as uh, raising tax incentives for corporations to come and invest. And that's uh, really have become a race to the bottom in, in many uh, uh, perspectives. And, and therefore, the solution must be collective and must be global and not just even regional and certainly not at the national level. So the, uh, the road is still long uh, ahead of us to have a multilateral cooperation on taxations. Um, and meanwhile, I think these are some of the elements that we can look at, uh, both corruption, anti-corruption, illicit flows, and frankly, a, a stronger uh, governance uh, regimes, including a stronger role for parliaments on uh, holding governments accountable on these various uh, topics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it appears that uh, Alisa Barsana has had to, to leave our meeting, so um, unfortunately I can't give the floor back to her. Um, we are pretty much, I think, unless there are further interventions that I have not recognized yet, uh, coming to the end of our, of our session, um, well in advance of the time that was scheduled, um, I'm going to say that that was probably due to the exceptional quality of our interventions from the panelists, from our lead discussants, Maybe some of it was due to excellent moderation. <laughs> but be because we have that little extra time, I'm going to throw out two things that I would like us to think about um, during the course of the rest of the Commission's meetings and as we take them back home uh, when we leave. The first is uh, the question that was raised earlier in the audience about w to what extent one can mobilize the private sector for social protection. And what I have seen in, in some of my work with the private financial sector is that the emphasis on impact investing is becoming more and more important. And I refer now to a particular experience that quite <laughs> surprised me. I was with a very, very large investment bank here. These are capitalists of the highest caliber. And their private clients are asking them for advice on how they can Im invest with impact. And what this bank has done is taken the targets of the SDG, of the 2030 agenda, and looked to see in what areas of that agenda the private sector or private firms have been active, and it has been recommending to its private clients to invest in firms that are generating positive impact in areas like healthcare or in education. And, and this is a change, a signal change from the way in which private investment was conducted in the past, and we see it happening more and more. So that might be one way in which... Uh, private enterprise, private capital, private investment, can be directed to types of investments that generate a social outcome, if you will, even if they are not formally social protection investments. The second thing that I think we all have to think about with increasing urgency is the changing nature of work. The ILO released uh, on the 22nd of January a truly impressive and, and thought-provoking report on the future of work. And one of the things that we have to take into account is that just the way in which technology is advancing and at the speed at which it's advancing, it is changing fundamentally the way in which people are employed, changing the nature of that relationship. Many of the social protection instruments that we have in the back of our mind when we talk about social protection, we talk about uh, expenditures um, on the fiscal side, these are instruments that we will have to reconsider because the nature of work is changing and the nature of the relationship between the employer and the former employee is also changing. This is not to say we can't deliver social protection, but the instruments that we've used in the past, so closely linked to the formal working relationship, we will have to reconsider them because that formal working relationship is evolving more rapidly than any of us are comfortable with. So with that, Madam Chair, I will thank the panelists again. I'll thank the lead discussants. I'll thank all of you here in the, in the auditorium this evening for your very thought-provoking interventions and, and, and comments. And I will pass the floor back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. And indeed, today we could see that the perspectives of the regional commissions and the UN agencies, funds and programs, and the UN system when it comes to inequalities, when it comes to this discussion that we had today, was, is very important considering their work on the ground, their role and contribution to the implementation of SDG 10, the work with the governments 
on, on these indicators. And I think our discussion today was indeed very re revealing in terms of new perspectives, dimensions, but also contexts of inequalities that is so important for us to continue to explore. So indeed, it was a substantive uh, discussion today. So without distinguished delegates, we have reached the end of our dialogue today with senior officials of the United Nations system on the priority theme. I thank the moderator, uh, Mr. Harris, for his skillful guidance of the discussion, and I also thank the distinguished panelists, the discussion, discussants, the delegations of member states and the NGOs representatives who, uh, for their participation and contributions. And on an organizational uh, point, I would like to inform the Commission that the general discussion of agenda item three, sub item A and B, will resume tomorrow in the morning at 10 a.m. The updated list of speakers has been posted on e-delegates. And I also wish to remind delegations that the deadline for submission of draft proposals uh, is this coming Friday, 15th of February at 3 p.m. And before adjourning, I would like to give the floor to the Secretariat for the brief announcement. Thank you very much. Just to draw a delegation's attention, there are some materials that have been uh, left on the side of the room for your attention regarding side events and other matters if, for, for your interest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, we wish you a wonderful afternoon, and the meeting is adjourned.